Well, if a fellow wants to make a career out of working on rusty old junk, these are the weapons of choice. That's a chipping hammer, and that's a needle scaler. This is a Chicago pneumatic. This one, I don't know what it is. It may be a Chicago pneumatic. It just says Made in USA. Anyway, this one I think works sometimes. Like so. But this one, she don't work at all. So I think we're gonna find out that there's some kind of a piston or something that's seized up or an o-ring has blown out or something's going on these are both you know high quality industrial tools but they take a beating so thought it might be interesting i've never been inside one of these so i thought we could crack one open and see see what there is to it so really for all intents and purposes these needle scalers are just basically air hammers Except it's got this fancy attachment on here with all the needles in it. And this thing is just a collar that kind of changes how far the needles are spread. Anyway. Now, these needles do break from time to time, so you have to replace them. It's kind of a, a wear item. So that's the business end of it. Yeah, I'm not sure which end we go we go in from, but I see a flat here and a big nut there, so I think we'll just Alright, so this thing appears to just be some kind of a jam nut. And we got shims falling out. Okay. Are these shims or Belleville washers? Shims. Now well, she's looking a bit rusty. I run an air dryer, but that doesn't mean that much. Okay, I'm kind of thinking the problem is here with the rust on these faces. So I think we're going to be doing some lapping. Ah, so the plot thickens. There's a little disc that fits between this piece and this piece. And that little disc must be the valve. So I think that's going to be our problem. We're gonna have some corrosion here on this face. So I think we just need to lap these surfaces and see how she goes. Okay. So those dowel pins, I guess, just sit in there. Well, there's a few ridges on this little valve disc I don't like that, so I'm going to lap it just a hair. So I'm just using the, this is a Kurt Weiss jaw. Should be plenty flat for this. doesn't take much. Okay, I've got all the parts cleaned up and I'm ready to put it back together, but I thought maybe we should talk about how it actually works because I didn't know. Like I said, I never had one of these apart before. So this is a drawing of how I think the thing actually works. So this piece right here is this thing. This black section here is the little valve disc or pop it, whatever you want to call it. And then this section right here is this piece and this is the piston right here. The piston goes inside of a cylinder. The cylinder is actually built into the body of the needle scaler. I don't want to take that out so we'll use our imagination. There's a couple of ports built into that cylinder 
Those are exhaust ports and basically the piston is its own valve. So as the piston moves back and forth, it uncovers one or the other of these exhaust valves, kind of like a two-stroke engine. So we do not need a separate valve here to exhaust the air. The piston is its own valve. Anyway, what's going to happen here is pressurized air is going to come in over here. This is where the valve and stuff is that we, you know, the little trigger that we push. And it's going to come into one of these four ports in this piece here. I've only shown two of them, but there's actually four. They're pretty much, you know, symmetrical top and bottom. So what happens is the air pressure, you know, builds up here on this side of the poppet and it fills up this side of the cylinder and it shoves the piston back towards the towards the back end of the needle scaler, you know, back towards your hand basically. And when it gets to the end of its stroke, it's going to uncover this exhaust port right here. So when the exhaust port opens, the pressure that's been built up here to move that piston back, it basically drops down to almost zero. And when the pressure drops on this side of this little poppet valve, there's nothing to hold it against this face. So what happens is the pressure on the other side of the poppet valve actually becomes greater than the pressure on this side of the poppet valve and this little poppet valve is going to actually move to the other side and it's going to cover up the other seat of the valve. So when that happens pressure is going to build up on this side of the poppet valve. It's going to come out this passage and it's going to fill this side of the cylinder shoving the piston away from your hand towards the other end of the tool. This is going to create our impact down here. Now same thing. As soon as the exhaust port is opened the pressure here is going to drop basically to zero. So when the pressure drops to zero here, there will no longer be any pressure here to hold this little poppet disc against this valve face. And you guessed it, the air is going to push the poppet valve back against the other seat and we're going to once again build pressure on the other side of the piston. So that is the magic of how this thing works. Now there's a little bit more trickery to it and it has to do with the size of the valve seats. So there's actually this one here on this side of the poppet valve, the effective area there, let's say 470 thousandths. So what? 11.9 millimeters. Now the effective area of the other side is actually a little bit larger. So 13.4, come on, uh, 530 thousandths. So what that's going to do is actually create a little bit of a bias in this poppet valve. So let's say like the piston is just kind of lost somewhere in the middle of its stroke and neither one of these exhaust ports is fully open. What's going to happen is the pressure is going to build, you know, basically equally on either side of this little poppet valve. But because the effective area is larger on this side, it's going to bias this side of the poppet valve. So that basically means if the piston's not, you know, where it's supposed to be, which is basically at the end of its travel, the the valve's going to bias towards the return stroke. Anyway, so what I think happened, why our tool wasn't working, why when we pushed the trigger it was just exhausting air out, is that this little disc, this little poppet disc here, got stuck. And maybe it got rusted to one of these seats or you know, there was some goo or something in there keeping the thing from, from floating the way that it was supposed to. Now you'll notice there's no O-rings, there's no rings, there's nothing here. This is a pretty sloppy system. It, it's going to leak basically around every part of this component. The only reason that it works is because all this stuff happens so fast. You know, it's making hundreds or thousands of strokes a minute and they're basically, it doesn't matter if we have a lot of air loss because you know we're still getting enough work out of the tool to be effective. So anyway I hope that helps. That's my two cents on how this this thing works. And as far as I know air hammers and other you know impact tools they all work basically the same way. Okay let's put it back together and see if it'll work. I'm gonna use a little bit of WD-40 here. Right. <clears throat> ok, 
Okay, that sounds good. Now the piston. Well, I'm thinking maybe the best way to do this is to flip it upside down. Kind of go like this. Yeah, like that. Now we've got all these shims. Well, what do we think? Is it going to work? Awesome. All right, let's go for a test drive. Hearing protection is not optional when it comes to these tools. Well, you ever have one of those days where you just can't talk? Anyway, it works, and surprisingly, there ain't a whole lot going on inside of one of these little guys. I just threw the number in the old Ask Jeeves machine over there. A new one of these will set you back over $600, and, you know, that's for the Chicago pneumatic. I think these are still made in the USA, but this one's from 1998, and I don't even know how long I've had it, and it was used when I got it, and this is the first time I've ever had any problems with it at all. And this chipping hammer, like I said, I don't know who made this thing or how much one of these would cost, but these are really handy too, especially if you get into a lot of the nasty, you know, rusty frames and stuff like I have to deal with. This thing's pretty sweet. You can really get in there and, and dig. Well, I don't know if that's something you guys are going to want to see or not. It's a little bit outside of our normal, our normal wheelhouse, but, you know, we had a problem and we fixed that problem and now we can get back to work. So I got to get back to the old trailer hitch over there. Somebody did the old rattle can rebuild and uh, <laughs> I think she needs a little more work than that. Well, how about some bonus footage? I've owned this pickup for I think about a year and a half now and the tailgate's never opened or closed correctly the entire time. And I finally broke the... Let's see. Yeah, I broke the actual handle off. So... I found a used tailgate that's in horrible shape, but the guts were pretty good. So I stripped all the latch mechanism out and swapped it over to my current tailgate, which is not good, but it's better than that. And then, and the other problem is these posts, which are basically like the hinge for the tailgate. I think when Ford originally made them, there was a plate on the inside of the sheet metal here that was spot welded to the sheet metal, and then they used these big flathead screws to hold them together but over time the plate the spot welds in the plate in the inside break off and then these posts get way overloaded by people like me who abuse their trucks and you know the sheet metal deforms in here and pretty soon your tailgate's falling off all the time so I just welded her up solid if it comes off there now we got serious problems 